Hello, everyone. Thank you for joining today's conversation on corruption, me corruption measurement as an agent of change. It's so wonderful to be back in person again, and one of the key benefits of being together in person in this room is that we can have a real interactive conversation. And so I urge our panelists, as you have questions or comments for each other, to please raise them. And at about 45 minutes in, after the moderated portion, I also urge all of you in the audience, both virtually and in person, to join the dialogue. This is a working session, so our aim is that collectively, with all of the experience and expertise in this room, at the end of the conversation, we can walk away with new ideas and new actions that can help us curb corruption and its harmful effect on people all over the world. And these, the consequences of corruption are ever so apparent. We just have to read the news to see how corruption is undermining democracy by supporting authoritarian regimes. We've seen how during the pandemic, corruption has taken away life-saving resources from those who need it the most. And today we are here to talk about measuring corruption. And I wanna begin by setting a tone of humility, which is to recognize that corruption is something that is meant to be hidden and undetected. So there's no perfect answer as to, and no complete accurate way to measure corruption. We might get into the details of various pros and cons of methodology, but I want to focus our North Star on corruption measurement as an agent of change. And today I'm honored to introduce to you four panelists who can offer diverse experiences and perspectives on this topic. Our first panelist is Mr. Wu Wei Neng. Actually, you know what, I will go in order of the, the um, slides up there. So our first panelist is Kamala Yadi, who has held many high-level positions in government, including as Minister of Public Service, Governance, and Anti-Corruption. He has also founded several civil society organizations, is a board member of the World Justice Project, and is a member of the Chandler Sessions on Integrity and Corruption, which our foundation sponsors at Oxford University. Our second panelist is Alina Mungyu Pipidi. She is a professor at the Hertie School in Berlin and is director of the European Research Center for Anti-Corruption and State Building. She is the author of many books and has developed multiple corruption-related indices and has also founded a watchdog platform in Romania. Our third panelist is Vinicius Hayes. He is a researcher at Transparency International Brazil's Anti-Corruption Knowledge Center, which received an honorable mention in this year's World Justice Challenge competition. And our fourth panelist is Wu Wei Neng, who is the executive director of the Chandler Institute of Governance, an organization that provides training and capability building to governments. He has various adjunct appointments with the Singapore government, including as the Singapore, at the Singapore Civil Service College. And lastly, my name is Leslie Tsai. I am the director of social investment at the Chandler Foundation, where I lead our grant programs, including our work on anti-corruption. So, my first question is to you, Kamal, and to offer the government perspective on this topic. As the former minister who was in charge of anti-corruption efforts, why is corruption measurement important to you, and what are some qualities that you look for in a measurement tool to help those in your position who are within government and leading anti-corruption efforts? Good morning, everyone. Thank you, Leslie, for the opportunity to speak about this uh, timely and highly topical uh, issue, which uh, government are uh, considering in their way uh, to move uh, towards what we call the new, uh, new generation of uh, anti-corruption strategy. So they are considering uh, to uh, introduce, uh, to integrate uh, measurement tools in the way uh, they are uh, approaching uh, this uh, new uh, anti-corruption uh, strategies to be able to assess progress and to, to identify shortcomings. So uh, speaking from a government position, as uh, you asked me to do from a government uh, perspective, I would uh, say that uh, there is a positive development uh, uh, over the past years in the way governments are uh, dealing with uh, international global uh, measurement indices. Uh, I can uh, uh, give a number of examples, but I will just uh, stick to the most uh, recent uh, ones. 
Uh, over the past weeks, I was speaking to uh, some uh, uh, heads of anti-corruption anti uh, uh, commissions in uh, some Arab and uh, African countries to persuade them to participate in this forum. And we touched on, on the issue of uh, uh, global uh, measurement uh, indices. And what I have understood from uh, our discussions that uh, they are uh, concerned about uh, uh, their ranking in uh, global indices because uh, they thought that uh, uh, their local efforts uh, they are not uh, reflected uh, in the outcome of these uh, indices. So they told me that they are uh, very much keen to work with the uh, agency and the uh, institution which are developing such indices uh, to uh, better understand these uh, uh, indexes and uh, how, are they, how are they structured and what uh, do they measure exactly. So uh, this, uh, I, I, I believe that uh, there is a uh, the tendency for uh, government to uh, reconsider their uh, old position about uh, global indices. So they don't see these uh, indices uh, as uh, a threat or as, uh, 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 as a disadvantage. Uh, and I would come back to uh, explain why uh, international indices could be seen as a uh, as a constraint for a local uh, government. But I want uh, just to, to, uh, to interpret uh, this uh, shift, uh, paradigm shift uh, in the position of uh, government in their way to deal with uh, international indices. So there are at least three facts for that. The first fact is that uh, government, they are aware that uh, they are uh, these indices, global indices that are the lens through which they are uh, seen uh, from abroad. They like it or they don't like these indices and their outcome and their ranking. This is a matter of fact. So they need to work with this. So the second indices, the second uh, fact is that uh, uh, governments are aware that uh, they are uh, competing with each other to attract foreign direct investment. So they need to project the best image from themselves to be able to attract um, uh, international investors. And the third fact, they know that uh, uh, global investors, they are very much sensitive to global indices because they use them, they use their data to uh, assess the investment risk. So before investing in one country, they will go to these indices. I'm not only talking about indices related to anti-corruption or to the rule of law, law but uh, indices in general. So governments, uh, I'm talking about governments in the countries which uh, have the reputation of being corrupt. They are more, uh, more and more aware about the impact and the effect of these indices and they wanted to work uh, with uh, this. Let me come back to the first issue that I have raised in, uh, uh, at the beginning. Why uh, these indices could be seen as uh, a threat or as, uh, as a constraint for a government? For the simple reason, because some indices, they were designed in such a way to be used as uh, advocacy tools. They are mostly used by, uh, uh, by politicians, by political activists, by civil society activists, by media, to put uh, uh, to, to blame and shame uh, governments and to press these governments to, to change and to put uh, uh, anti-corruption in their own agenda. I'm not saying this is a bad thing. This is a posi positive thing because it uh, was able to drive uh, uh, a tremendous change in this uh, country to consider uh, working on anti-corruption. But uh, we uh, need to admit that the uh, time has changed. We have come a long way and uh, now uh, government, the, the, the issue of for government is not whether or not to, to address corruption by how to address the uh, corruption. So they are looking for indices which can help them to measure uh, progress, which indices that don't focus only on shortcoming and the uh, failures. They need uh, such indices uh, because if, I, if they are in the light of uh, global indices and blamed every time about uh, their performance, they will not be able to improve. So this is my advice, this is my recommendation to institutions which uh, develop uh, such indices to look for the needs, the local needs of government. I will uh, end with an example that uh, I experienced in my uh, career. In 2005, uh, uh, the UNDP issued a very famous report about the knowledge society in the Arab countries. And this report was very, very, uh, provide a lot of criticism towards the Arab countries. 
because they focus on some dimensions of knowledge society. They focus on freedom of expression. They focus on, focus on uh, democracy. Of course, uh, these issues uh, are linked to knowledge society, but this is not all the issue that we need to address when we talk about knowledge society. There is connectivity, infrastructure, uh, digital divide, and so on. So uh, in 2008, uh, I was uh, asked by the Brooklyn, Brooking Institution to lead a team of experts to, uh, to, to produce a report, uh, UNDP plus, plus three. And I told them from the beginning, you must look to history. In 2005, when the UNDP issued this very critical report, this report was banned from the Arab countries. Any, any newspaper cannot speak about, you cannot write, write articles about this. So what is the point if you issue an article which is rejected by, by a government? You need to say the truth, to tell the reality, but leave a room to work with government. So I persuaded the, uh, uh, the Brookings Institution that we need to shift, we need to do things differently. Say the, the reality, but instead of uh, focusing on shortcomings, on failures, blaming government, we try to focus on some uh, aspects where government have improved. So, uh, and uh, it was like this, and the report was issued in 2008, and we were able to present it uh, to government, although there, uh, there, are, there was a lot of uh, criticism in some aspect, but we, 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 we put focus on uh, the aspects which uh, uh, governments were doing uh, good. So, uh, think, uh, we need to uh, direct some, uh, direct some uh, recommendation to government to work with these NDCs because uh, they can uh, give you the opportunity to see where you sit in terms of global ranking. But we have also to give some advices and some recommendation to those who are designing uh, global NDCs that think of the other side of uh, government. Uh, how can you use your data? How can you use your materials to improve what they are doing? Thank you. Thank you, Kamal. That's a very valuable um, uh, insights from an insider government perspective, especially reform-minded governments that want to make a change. And I think this next question will be a nice complement to that. And this is to Vinicius. So Transparency International puts out one of the most well-known corruption indices out there, the Corruption Perceptions Index. And TI Brazil, um, through your work at the Knowledge Center, also puts together subnational local corruption measurement tools. And I'm curious how these different tools uh, complement each other, how they're different, and perhaps you can also respond to some of the comments that Kamal just made. Yes, of course. Uh, thank you, Leslie. Thank you uh, to the WJP and the Chandler Foundation for the opportunity to speak here today. Uh, on behalf of Transparency International Brazil. And also thank you, Camille, for your, your comment. I think that uh, the history that I'm trying to convene here today and talk uh, to you about the history of how TI Brazil has been working uh, with uh, subnational governments is a history of dialogue above all. So I think that we have been able to partner with local governments to develop their uh, integrity, transparency, open data uh, policies. So, uh, of course, uh, Transparency International, the global movement, every year launches the CPI, the Corruption Perception Index, uh, since 1995, and that has become one of the most uh, important uh, corruption indices in the world. Uh, but as we were launching uh, the, the results, the CPI results, every year in Brazil, um, we always try to bring some sort of context to it and try to interpret the results. And we started hearing from uh, subnational authorities, from uh, state officers, uh, that they wanted to have uh, some sort of assessment tool to know, to keep track of what they were doing. They wanted, as they said, a CPI for Brazilian states. So uh, we started developing uh, the idea of what could become an index for uh, Brazilian states mostly. Um, so that uh, led us to a first project called Integrity in Brazilian States, in which uh, we partnered with uh, seven states to have a, a wide uh, assessment of their practices, of their uh, policies, of institutions as well, and to know how they were uh, doing in terms of um, transparency, open data, procurement, uh, many uh, relevant uh, issues. And uh, we had some interesting results, and actually that led us to um, help them build seven different uh, integrity plans for their own governments. After that, uh, actually, as this project was going on, the pandemic broke out, of course, 
And then we developed a transparency ranking, which is the, the project that led me uh, this day to be here uh, speaking to you. Um, this was the project that received an honorable mention at the World Justice uh, Challenge. And for this project, we uh, developed a, an assessment tool, an assessment methodology uh, for all uh, 26 states in Brazil, for the federal district, for 26 state capitals, and for the federal government. Of course, uh, Brazil is a federative uh, country in which the federal government holds most power, uh, most of the power mo and most uh, responsibilities. Uh, but uh, subnational governments have a very important role to play here. And of course, during the pandemic, they had a lot of uh, leeway to um, do emergency procurement, for example. So uh, this uh, index focused mostly on emergency procurement, as I've said, but also donations, uh, uh, emergency welfare measures, and um, economic uh, rescue measures as well. And we had some interesting results, actually. We had um, 92, so we had, uh, as I said, 54 uh, governments in total being assessed. And out of those 54, 92% uh, actually sought advice from TI Brazil to develop their practices, to improve their uh, transparency portals, uh, and to have information ready and available for the population. So that was a very interesting result that we had. And besides this project, we partnered with, um, if I'm not mistaken, with uh, seven, uh, 17 uh, local civil society organizations uh, in eight Brazilian states, and they were able to adopt the same methodology to assess 89 cities in Brazil. Brazil has 5,500 municipalities with a lot of um, independence to, to conduct policy. So we had uh, the honor and the opportunity to work with uh, local organizations to assess 89 of them. Um, after that, we developed a, another index, now focusing more on digital transformation that is called the Digital Transformation and Integrity Index, only focused on uh, states and the federal district. And we had also interesting results. We actually found out that uh, most states had a lot to do yet uh, in terms of anti-corruption databases that, databases that are considered strategic to fight corruption uh, in Brazil. So they, they weren't, uh, for example, uh, in open formats as they should to, to make uh, accountability and oversight more effective. And right now, we're uh, after these three projects, we are working, as we speak, <laughs> on a project uh, called the um, uh, Public Governance and Transparency Index. That is going to be our flagship project for the next few years, and it consolidates this experience uh, this previous experience that we had with uh, subnational governments. So we're going to assess three different sets of institutions. The first one is uh, state governments and the federal district, in total 27 governments, the executive branch. The second one is uh, 26 uh, state legislative chambers and the legislative chamber of the, um, the federal district. So again, 27 chambers. And we also partner, once again, with local uh, civil society organizations. Now we're partnering with nine civil society organizations to assess 163 municipalities throughout Brazil in different regions, different states. So that is uh, the, the path that we've been uh, crossing so far. And um, of course, I hope that I can, I can talk to you about the results of this uh, last project uh, very soon. We're conducting it right now. We have results coming out uh, between June and August. And I look forward to talking to you more about it and, of course, sharing some more of our experience here. Thank you so much. Thank you, Vinicius, for sharing that perspective on uh, the measurement of corruption um, in subnational governments in Brazil. And I think um, you had provided some good examples of collaboration with government as well as with civil society.
My next question is to you, Alina. So you've developed a number of corruption index indices and different corruption measurement tools. And we've been talking about the government perspective, civil society. Your tools also target uh, bilateral, multilateral institutions. Uh, and curious, what role do these stakeholders play? Um, and if you can share a little bit about the indices you've developed, I know um, our, uh, our staff is ready to share some of those on screen as well. Uh, thank you very much, and uh, I'll actually go up the moment when uh, when the webpage Corruption Risk Org will be on screen behind me. I'll go up and and try to show it. So first, very briefly put, I am in the in the strange position of being a corruption professor. Okay, I was <laughs> I was educated to be a real scientist. I have a full PhD from a medical school. My father hoped that I'm you know going to take the Nobel Prize for medicine, and then. And then I have been to Harvard and studied political science, so my mother probably hoped that I'm, I'm going to be some serious professor doing political theory. My professor at Harvard used to call me at 6 o'clock in the morning to check up on my Aristoteles and, and everything that. Okay, but in the end of day, since I'm Romanian and I was 25 at the fall of the Berlin Wall in my country, I simply realized that we had inherited a 100% corrupt country because corruption is basically discretionary power. And when you have a small number of people controlling everything, it means that they control all the rents. Everything is a rent, you know, from the very smallest thing, trying to find out what is the composition of the water is a rent and you have to pay for it. And of course they will oppose that this becomes public information because then they lose their income. And therefore, my life as an activist began for about 10 years, and everything else that I wanted to do, I had to put aside. And I said, okay, yes, I had this great water project. Yes, we will do the water project, we will do the health project after we solve the fundamentals of corruption, all right? And here I've been for the past 25 years, except that I no longer work in my country, I work in a variety of countries, and I really have turned into a corruption professor, which managed to convince some of the greatest publishers in the world that corruption is a scientific topic, you know, and you can publish with Oxford and with Cambridge corruption books covering the entire world, because not only this is a topic, but it is the fundamental development topic. And I want to congratulate the organizers today for bringing us to what is, I really think, the next step. And the next step is that I think we have been all convinced by the past 30 years that corruption is a really bad thing, but in the same time, the world has not progressed for the past 30 years. Yes, we have very rough indicators, and I'll explain in a second why they are so rough, but by all indicators, all right? All indicators and by individual country stories, we do not have sufficient success stories. I worked with my co-author, Professor Michael Johnson, to collect all the countries which moved from systematic corruption to corruption as an exception, not to zero corruption because this doesn't exist, to corruption as an exception in our lifetime, right? For the past 30, 40 years. Okay, so we used to have 10 cases and those were really very contested. I think we're now down to about seven. And every day I look around in the news really very worriedly not to see another of our achievers slide back, you know, the, the Georgias and, and the other countries of the world which started by being big success stories and now they're less and less success stories. So I really needed to go back and work on historical case studies to have sufficient case studies. Why do we need to measure corruption? You know, because this first generation of indicators that we had was great to raise awareness. I'm a great believer in naming and shaming. I think they did a good job. But on the other hand, there's nothing much to do with an indicator which is non-specific. It doesn't tell you anything exactly what goes on. And it's so tremendously lagging. It is based on disaggregated scores given by experts perhaps two, three years ago. Anyway, you do not know what these experts have in mind. It's like I ask you all of you in this room to rate Netherlands. Please rate Netherlands on a scale from one to 10, where 10 is the most corrupt and one is the least corrupt, okay? Don't tell me what you think. Just pick a number for Netherlands. If I will take you from left to the right, we will see that we get scores from like four up to eight or something like this. We'll put it in a basket, we'll extract an average, and this average is gonna be a perception indicator that we report. And when we report it for next year, I have to allow some statistic for putting all this together. So I'll build what is called a confidence error. Actually, what is this? It's simply a difference between your opinions. That's gonna be large, right? Because if you come from a really corrupt country, you're gonna find Netherlands pretty clean. 
But if you come from a really corrupt country, a really, you know, a decent country, if you come from Denmark, you're gonna see that's a lot of dirt out here, so that means that they're more corrupt than we are in Denmark, right? And I have to somehow reflect this. What reflects this, this confidence error, is generally where any change is lost. Because this is reported from one year to another as a time lag, and everything which changes anyway, corruption changes with big difficulty. I have these two slides for 35 years, where I show how two countries at the opposite sides of the political spectrum, Poland and Chile, improved their democracy spectacularly, right? So Chile has a right-wing dictatorship, and they become liberal, and they go up like this. And Poland had communism, and they held elections, round table, they also go up like this. And you see how pluralism goes up in the two countries, and you see how the governance line stays absolutely flat, like nothing happened in 1989. So the way you distribute resources in a society, if you distribute them equally to everybody, or if you distribute them according to the structure of power, is really very basic. It's more difficult to change governance than it is to change political regime. Because in my life, we changed a lot of political regimes. I've seen Milosevic fall, I've seen Yanukovych fall, I've seen Ceausescu fall, so you know. But things haven't changed enough, all right? And this is the challenge. And this is why we need a new generation of instruments, not just a generation of instruments to make people aware and to shame them by comparing them with other countries, although this is great. This is absolutely, you know, it was a very necessary step, but one by which you can monitor what governments do, okay? And this is what we do. But just one more specification here, right? We're talking two types of instruments. We're talking two types of levels. And this matter very much because it's a lot of confusion in, in literature and real life. All of you can measure corruption for instance. And all of you, if you are ever in need of a special project where you want to monitor corruption, as you should in a project, in an evaluation design, like the before and after your intervention, if your government, your civil society, you want to see if your intervention, right, change something. So the instruments should be designed particularly for your project. You, we can measure everything which can be defined, and there is not one measurement of corruption in the world. Nobody's gonna take Nobel Prize for inventing one corruption measurement, okay? You can define corruption as social loss, you can define corruption as lack of transparency, you can define corruption as graft, you can define corruption as a variety of ways. It's not even true that it's hidden, you know? There are some people who measure corruption by the number of exceptions to the plates of cars. I've seen a, reviewed recently a very funny paper. You know, people who want to have fancy cars, by the way, this doesn't mean corruption is hidden, right? You know that in many countries, corruption is a status thing. So if I'm corrupt, I really want to have this castle, and I want to have this castle in my native village so that everybody sees how far li in life I've got, you know, on a, life, on a wage of a public policeman or on a wage of... Yeah. So it's not really hidden. You can just count castle, you know? When I was an activist, I just told everybody, please report to me went on television, I told people, please report to me all secret houses of the head of secret service. You know what, in three days I had three, you know, people, three I could verify because otherwise there's full of maniacs, okay? I, I could verify three very easily, okay? So on Friday, the guy resigned and he was from Ceausescu's time guy, so it was very easy to bring him down because everybody could observe his corruption. He went there on weekends by helicopters, you know, so really to hide this in a, in a village. <laughs> Okay, and had through these lavish parties. <laughs> okay, but leaving this aside, so these are the small designs, designs which fit whatever you want to do, education, health, whatever. And we provide a lot of education at 30 for this, so we can help everybody craft a small design. All we need to do is narrow corruption precisely, the one you are interested in, and then we'd be able to measure it. But what I'm gonna show on the website is something that I developed for everybody, in particularly people who are permanently in anti-corruption business, because there seem to be quite a lot of people out there. So I developed the next generation of instruments, starting from perception instrument and based on analytics. And you can see this instrument. So first you will see the country, every country. We only have unfortunately 115 countries. All the countries with corruption explained. We now have 30 years research on corruption and we know that corruption happens when we have this disequilibrium, this balance between factors which produce corruption, opportunities of corruption, and factors which constrain corruption. 
Now, these factors are measurable. Some of them are measurable on a permanent basis. We selected them and not others on the basis of research. So the difference between what we do here, for instance, and the pillars of integrity that some of you might heard about, is that pillars of integrity are normative. I look at you and I consider that all of you should be honest men, right? And also fairly athletic men for this room of ours to be fit for any challenge. <laughs> but, but in the same time, I'm telling myself that the two people who stand by the door are closer by the door, so it's really very important in case of a fire breaking out that they are fit, that they hear well, and they smell well, and they can open. So this is how research is based, okay? I select those two people at the door, and the two, three, and I eliminate the others. Yes, it's nice if everyone will be fair, but that's not what research does. Research is analytical. We select things, and we put them into a sequence in order to know more than what the lay people know. Okay, and this, are our, this is our corruption. Corruption is based on this model, opportunities versus constraints. And what you see here, I'll start moving up and finish as fast. Uh, if I can go into the public integrity tab, thank you very much, that one, okay. So you start here with this map, okay? This map is an index. So it has a disadvantage of an index, which I just said, we put some things together. But in the same time, you know exactly what is in this index. In this index, there are the opportunities and there are the corruption. Can we go to, where are we, in Netherlands? Let's just go to Netherlands, if you can, please, for me. Thank you. And click on the country profile for Netherlands. Okay, so here is Netherlands. In Netherlands, we're gonna see two things. One is, how is Netherlands capable, the Netherlands society? Are they capable to control people with power who are in government, to abuse public resources because it's how corruption happened? How capable are them? And they look fairly capable. They're number five in the world out of 114 countries and they get this mark, right? How transparent is Netherlands? You see it here, but let's go down because important is to understand exactly what this score mean and to go to translate the scores directly to something real that you can touch. So let's go down, let's go down first to the transparency index, if we can. Click on the transparency. Okay, here is the transparency index. And this is something which we will do a lot more in the future and you will do a lot more in the future. Why? Because the world has turned digital and things where I had to ask the public of my television when I had a television 25 years ago, uh, now everybody can do because you have internet. We didn't have internet, right? So now it is very simple. The world is becoming digital. All governments, including the poorest, have to invest in government and everything which is out there can be built into knowledge, can be built into an instrument. So what did we do here? What did we do here is that we selected using United Nations Convention Against Corruption and Sustainable Development Goal 16, we selected 14 relevant websites and data repositories that every government must have in order to empower citizens to defend themselves from corruption. Because it's not just about fighting corruption, it's about people defending themselves from being discriminated. If somebody gets a favor, somebody else is discriminated. This is how corruption works. And for instance, in the judiciary, what are those? Having all the laws online, having all the hearing schedules online so that transparently you can go to every room you know, where, where a court session is held and having all the judicial motivations and proceedings online. Okay, so if you do all this, we give you a 100% fulfillment point. And this is like the judicial part of this transparency index. Then there is the administrative part, the public procurement, the property. It's important that land is also registered. It's important that companies are registered, that there is no beneficial ownership, that we know exactly where companies, but not just beneficial. We need to know all the ownership. And everybody needs to know, and without paying, the poor should also be able to access this data. Otherwise, they're gonna be abused, you know, frauds are gonna be committed. So we built all this into these 14 points, and if you fulfill all of them, there are countries in the world which are closed, uh, then you get 100%. On the other hand, before us, 
there has been a lot of reliance on freedom of information and on what we call the jure, legal transparency. So transparency is legal and real. And a lot of people these days write paper where they say, oh, but transparency doesn't really matter. Because, you know, this country has adopted all this transparency legislation and adopted freedom of information. And nevertheless, corruption didn't change. Well, it didn't, because as we all know here, or that we're a room of practitioners, implementation gaps exist. And this is why I built this concept with the de jure, what you sign you're going to do, and the de facto, what you actually do. So the total index puts together the both sides, and me who researched it, I can tell you that what matters is de facto, right? I mean, my country adopted a freedom of information law, which I was big part, big story, and Albania adopted it another year later. For us, it was a major thing. I, w I personally was in court over 200 times over it in the space of 10 years, and that made, made a difference. In Albania, they didn't do this, okay? So it mattered here, it didn't matter there, so the law in itself doesn't tell you much. Okay, so what you can do here is that you can see that this country has fulfills the 63% of the of this, 71% uh, of the world average, 75% of its income group average, so you can compare it with similarly rich countries, and 57% only of regional average, which in the case of Netherlands, it's Europe. So Netherlands is not doing so well in terms of actually computer-mediated transparency, right? They also don't need it as an anti-corruption instrument. That's why they don't in, you know, invest a lot. If we drill a little bit down, I'm going to show you how this, just on this page, just go down. Exactly. This is how we hope to see the next generation of index. I presume that all of you heard, or some of you heard, of the doing business scandal of the World Bank. Right, exactly. Where they added Hong Kong to China because they found no other way to put China a little bit up in, in the ranks. Now, but how could they do that? You know, Because they measured very special things. They measured time to to register a business and time to pay taxes. So you ask yourself, how could they do this? Well, the answer is because instead of seeing there exactly the time to pay taxes, what you saw there was a ranking given by a World Bank bureaucrat, right? And therefore, the World Bank bureaucrat has bosses, and the bosses could be pressured by the by the Chinese and, and the rest of the and the rest of the chain. Okay. So what can we do to defend ourselves from this? Rankings are influential, as we heard from our colleagues in government. If they're influential, it's going to be pressure. So first, I think rankings should not be produced by anybody who can be pressured. That's why people like us, you know, the small people from the academia who are experts, should produce things like this. Okay. And we should have money, of course, from public sources to do this, but not just one source of money. Chinese government came to me when I first produced the Index for Public Integrity. Third day, on Tuesday, I produced this in Paris at OECD, and on Friday, I got the first visit of a Chinese official in my office in Berlin, who said, great work, finally something objective. You've only got something really wrong. I said, oh, what is that? He said, China. <laughs> yes, you know, I, I, really, I really got that wrong. I said, how, how did I get it wrong exactly? And he said, well, you have in the constraints part, you have this indicator, which is called e-citizens. By the way, I don't understand it very well. I said, yes, it's digital citizens, you know. It's the power of the society, empowered citizens. It basically means number of internet households by country together with people associated by media. This explains two-thirds of the corruption in the world. Very powerful indicator. You know, people with a smartphone having internet because they can organize, get together, do stuff. Okay. And he said, yes, why don't we that China has zero? at social media. I said, maybe because you ban Facebook? And he said, yes, it's true, we ban Facebook, but we have another thing offered by the government, very good. I said, yes, I, I understand, but this is a proxy for capacity of action against government. Okay, so I really, I really don't know how to do, mm -hmm. how to do things. So, you know, things happen, but what do we want to do? Mm -hmm. Alina, I'm just yes, sorry I'm to finishing. cut you short. Okay, yeah, perfect. Yeah. <laughs> We should do them like this, okay? So when you want to see what is in the de facto score, you just drill down here to see to what extent country is full. And in case, in just in case, China or Saudi Arabia or somebody of other nice countries with money reached Alina and asked Alina to you know, mingle with something of this, just click on the Auditor's General Report. So click on any indicator and what will happen is that this will take you directly, just click on any of this. It will take you directly to the web page of that country. And then 
underneath, that's the web page. And underneath the whole thing, so you can see yourself if it's there and what's it's there. And underneath you're gonna have a feedback form. And the feedback form would say, was everything okay here? Because it's based on a crowdsourced thing, you know, like Wikipedia. Is everything okay here? If everything is not okay, please write to me. Say, Alina, I really got this wrong. This auditor page is very bad, you should have rated it zero, okay? That's your opinion, it doesn't matter. Sign, attach your documents, sign it there, and you're gonna discover the next month and the next revision that this is going to be reflected. So if we can just return to the general page, corruption forecast, and I'm done. <laughs> so this is the new generation of index, right? Granular, we can do a lot of other things like this because it's digitalization out there. Granular, every one of you is uh, a reviewer, every one of you is a contributor. Governments see exactly what they have to do, you know? They see exactly, thank you, stay here. Uh, they see exactly what they have to do. They see what's missing. They can compare with their neighbors. Why can their neighbors do better on this, on that? They cannot. It's a long, it's a clear roadmap where to go. And to end, what we have done is that we went back 12 years to build also a little bit of an assessment mechanism. Where do countries come from and where they go in the future? And you see here the essential elements selected by us. Budget transparency, administrative burden, judicial independence, press freedom, and e-citizenship, right? The opportunities and the constraints that, that we have. And this country is all in yellow, so that means it hasn't really changed in all this. And then there are two situations. Either country needed to change because it was corrupt, or country didn't need to change because it was Netherlands, or another country like this, okay? Right, so the forecast trend is stationary. And here is the legend. Here is a legend where we put in very clear words why we forecast this country to improve, to decline, or to stay where it is, okay? And that is how it all comes together. You start with an analytic, you look at the balance between constraints and uh, opportunities with the integrity index, you move into transparency, you see exactly granular what the country is missing compared to other countries, and then you look here, you see the trend, you see where the country is going, what has to change both in detail and both in the grand political design, because unfortunately, we have to confess, a lot of things are not going well these days due to politics. I'll just say this, the last thing. Governments improve a lot on budget transparency. They did some improvement on administrative burden, and there is, in the world, a gradual improvement of e-citizenship everywhere. Of course, in poor countries, it's still too little. We have to help more, you know, sub-Saharan African countries, but it's still, this have been going, look at e-citizenship here, you know, growing, growing. That's a natural growth. More people have smartphones with internet connections, right? But the world has not been going well because judicial independence and press freedom globally have been actually on the down for the past 15 years. Okay, and this is why control of corruption is not changing. And these are political factors, difficult to change, but at least that's your analytics, you know? We start from here, and then we build by country, by sector, by organization, everything you need to do, because we live in the digital era. Big advantage for us. Thank you, Alina. Clearly a very captivating <laughs> professor, experienced and captivating professor. Thank you so much. Uh, speaking of the need for next generation corruption measurement tools or governance measurement tools, my next question is for you, Wei Neng. The Chandler Institute of Governance puts out a good government index, a relatively new index that uh, just launched its second edition. And it measures corruption in relation to a number of other indicators to have an overall uh, measure and index around uh, good government and good governance. I was wondering if you could speak to um, why is it important to measure corruption amongst a number of other indicators? Um, and if you can share this perspective with the group today. Uh, so thanks very much and thanks to the WJP for the opportunity to be here and thanks to my other panelists for their comments which I've learned a lot from. So I just want to say I'm a little bit of an outlier on this panel because I know firstly I'm not so much of a measurer of corruption and more of a user of statistics that other people generate. So um, our index includes um, measures such as the rule of law index as well as the uh, Corruption Perceptions Index. So, but I'm a user of data, and secondly, I'm also 
um, a bit schizophrenic because I used to be in the government as well, uh, prior to the government of Singapore, uh, prior to um, starting the Channel Institute of Governance. So most of our work uh, takes place at the ground level with practitioners in government around the world. But uh, as part of our work, we also, as uh, Leslie mentioned, um, release and design and release an index uh, measuring good government. Now, now, there is no one definition of good government. So I'll just speak a little bit today about just what we see as good government, which is, of course, very closely related to the rule of law and very closely related to anti-corruption, as well as uh, maybe some thoughts on how we can measure it uh, and what it means. So firstly, to us, we take a model of good governance that is distilled from interviews with practitioners in government around the world. So we conducted over 100 interviews with practitioners in government around the world to try to code and understand what, what they saw as good government. So this is not so much from an academic conceptual framework of what good government should be, but it's the lived experiences of practitioners around the world and what they see as good government. So uh, we also focused on capabilities because I'm going to come back to that later. And I see that uh, several of my other panelists have also mentioned the importance of looking at capabilities and state capacity, state institutional capacity, and the relationship between that and the ability to have good rule of law and good anti-corruption control. So for us, good government is simply government that has good capabilities and that employs these capabilities to achieve good results that people care about. So there's a capabilities element to this and there's also an outcomes element to this. So why we think it's important? Um, firstly, just from a basic statistical point of view, um, measures for good government tend to be very closely correlated with measures for rule of law and measures for anti-corruption. So we see uh, countries that do well in the Chandler Good Government Index also tend to do very well in the WJP Rule of Law Index and well in the Corruption Perceptions Index. So that's something that's interesting to us, not so much from the point of view of research, but also from the point of view of what governments need to focus on more holistically, not just on, um, and, and I'm pleased to hear this in the panel this morning, that the plenary this morning, I'm sorry, that uh, we want to look not so much on a narrow technical definition of the rule of law, but on a broader definition of the rule of law that encompasses institutional strength, inclusion, uh, equal opportunities, uh, just societies, and also the ability of uh, governments to deliver on their promises to citizens and businesses. So why we want to care about this, as Kamel alluded to, is that uh, firstly, um, measurement across countries is always controversial. Uh, countries are very different. Uh, as a practitioner myself, you know, we understand that if you look at the countries that do well in the Chandler Good Government Index, they're all um, very diverse. So Singapore, for instance, is a lot very different from, say, Canada, or very different from uh, Denmark and Finland in many ways. Uh, both in terms of the culture of go governance, in terms of the institutional structure. And uh, so we, we noticed that there are differences between governments and government systems. But can governments learn from each other? And we do believe that's possible. So uh, during my time in government as well, we were very active in learning from other countries, very active in studying the experiences that we can adapt. Of course, not copy and paste wholesale, but adapt to our own needs and to address our own challenges. So we think there's a useful learning dynamic that we can play a part in encouraging uh, through the use of the Good Government Index, but also through the use of the Rule of Law Index and other measures that um, have global rankings that you can compare. And of course, like Adina's index as well, there's a lot of, uh, like she mentioned also, the ability for countries to compare how they're doing relative to regional averages and global averages. So it's, um, now we mentioned the role of global indices for advocacy, and it's useful for advocacy, it's useful for public uh, education, but it's also useful to help countries benchmark where they stand, uh, assuming the indices are, have a sufficient level of rigor that they can be used to benchmark, and that's useful for governments because they in turn are interested in how they are doing relative to other countries that they might be competing for, for investment, for talent, and for um, business. So having said that, we took uh, 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 you know, we, we had the conceptual framework of the index, which we distilled from the interviews, and then we had to look for ways to proxy or measure these qualities that we um, got back from these practitioners. So we were quite pleased that there was a lot of alignment between what various practitioners thought was important for good government. Uh, for instance, the, uh, I mean, very basically, of course, the ability to control corruption, the ability to budget, the ability to plan, the ability to... Um, have good public communications and stakeholder engagement. And these are capabilities that are broadly important across countries around the world, regardless of the level of uh, income or the region or the uh, other geographical factors that might be different uh, between the countries. And these are uh, capabilities that are core to the effective functioning of government. And they are core, as some of my co-panelists have said, uh, to the ability of governments to control corruption and the ability of governments to achieve good rule of law. 
So these are capabilities that are fairly generic, and then we look for ways to measure these capabilities. And that's where we come to the point that we are users of data. So we, um, we develop a concept of what good government is from our research, and then we look for ways to measure that. So th and that's when a lot of the uh, learning from my co-panelists has been very useful in terms of how do we find good ways to measure uh, corruption? Or how do we find good ways to measure the rule of law? And in that sense, I think I'll take the lead from Leslie that we do need a lot of, uh, I mean, uh, uh, at least from CIG, you know, we take a lot of humility uh, to this approach. We recognize that there is no one perfect measure, that we are always learning and always seeking to try to find better ways to measure the things we are measuring. So for instance, a lot of these um, variables, a lot of these metrics are um, either expert assessment driven or they are, um, you know, some form of uh, perception driven metrics. Of course, we do use around 50% uh, hard metrics, but there, there is a role, I think, to uh, combine subjective and more objective metrics because then you can triangulate and you can get a better picture of what's happening on the ground. Now, that's not to say, I, I think, and, and we will get to this a bit later in the conversation, I think, about the role of different types of indices to drive change, which is the, the, the topic of our panel today, and how uh, each can complement the other to, um, to assist governments and support governments. So again, I just want to echo Carmel and I'll stop after this, that I think it's very important for us as uh, nonprofits, as uh, organizations producing uh, data or producing information uh, to figure out ways to work constructively with government. And I think uh, what I found in my work with governments around the world as part of the CIG is that um, when we work with governments in the right way and we engage governments in constructive ways, we'll find that they're actually very um, willing to listen in most cases and they're very willing to learn. So I think that's a dynamic and a process that I just want to encourage among all of us. Thanks. Thank you, Wei-Nang. I had another round of questions for the panel, but given the time constraint, I really want to tap into the expertise and perspectives of those in this room. I'm sure there are many of you with uh, backgrounds on this topic and different perspectives on this topic. So um, again, since we have the advantage of being here in person, why don't I hand the floor off first to um, those in this room who have questions, if you can please um, stand up and walk over to this microphone um, to pose your questions and comments to the panel right here in the middle of the room. Thank you. Um, David Rios Garcia from Paraguay. I work on anti-corruption. Professor, uh, the ability to control corruption is obviously not equal to the capability to control corruption. And I find it fascinating that you use the proxy of capacity of action by the e-citizenship that you mentioned. Uh, although access and openness do not instantaneously lead to accountability, and Jonathan Fox and Faye Shorter have made this in the literature very clear, and I want to give just one example and then ask you the question. In Paraguay, we're one of the best in the world in public procurement. We follow the open contracting data standard and whatnot. But the ability of the civil society or the government to use that for accountability purposes is non-existent. So how do you control for that whenever you're doing the indicators? Thank you really very much for this question. You know, I have a variety of websites of mine which I have not shown to you today. But one of them, uh, lucky you, but one of them is uh, opentender.eu, where you will find 47 million contracts from 35 European countries with risk indicators already calculated by us and our IT teams. And you can search by contracting authority, by country, by sector, and by the company you suspect. And this model is taken by the World Bank these days and pushed driven by my former brilliant student, Mihaly Fazekas, now a professor at Central European University, all over the world where sufficient digitalization exists. But in a nutshell, what you have to do if you invested already in an e-procurement portal is this. It is not prosecutors who can clean your procurement. Because when prosecutors come to be involved, it's really too late. What you have to do is to stop corruption from happening. And if indeed the government has political will, this is very easy. The public procurement portal with minimal cost should be structured so to collect by contracting agency minimal statistics. I have some horribly blunt ones like state capture. Give more than 51% of your contracts or of the value of your contracts to one single private provider who sells you from, uh, I don't know, tanks to, to toilet paper, right? This, this is capture, right? 
So that is clear indicator, political connection, right? That's a simple algorithm that you have to put to connect the financial and conflict of interest disclosures, which a lot of corrupt countries have now online with the winners of the public procurement portal. I mean, you see this done very well in Croatia. It can be done. It's an algorithm, costs you nothing if all this data is already digitalized. Now, what do you have to do next to accountability? It's very simple. You have to have a public procurement policy. Government has to decide. Government has to say, these are my targets. You have an example in the European public procurement scoreboard, which we informed with our data when it was created. And you can say, you know, in this country, it's difficult to say. You don't believe in zero corruption, I guess, as I don't, if you lived in countries such as ours. But you know, let's say, how much capture do we want to have? Like 20%? Okay, it's okay to give 20% of your country to something. It's just a benchmark. We'll do 20, we want to reach this 20% in the next five years. What about competitiveness of procurement? It's not okay not to have non-competitive procurement. How much non-competitive procurement can be? Let's put it at the European threshold. It's like 14%. Right, non-competitive tenders. Non-competitive tenders, not because they're not by definition non-competitive, but because this is what we call single bidding. Because people know who's gonna win. So you only have one competitor because everybody knows it's fake. Okay, so you have these benchmarks. You are not allowed, as a, you know, Alina is the contracting authority. I'm not allowed to have over 14% single bidding. I am not allowed to have anything, this should be anything, which I do not publish, right, and fill in the national whatever. As in Colombia, who developed a great indicator, the number of contracts that I report should be the same as the number of contracts that I publish. The same that the number of contracts that I report to the national controller, so ratio should actually be one, right? So we have four indicators like this, and the fourth is capture, right? I should show you my Albanian report. It's out online this year. Capture throughout, I mean, you can just see. So what you should have to do then, you tie it into their management contracts. You said you are out of government procurement and you change them, okay? You cannot have this more than one year. I'll bring somebody else in charge of procurement who is going to enforce all this. And everything is out there, all the journalists can read it. You don't need millions in civil society. All you need is some passionate journalists, three, four of them who will read this. All this should be all the time on a monthly basis, all the statistics by contracting authority should be out there on your procurement webpage. And there's your monitoring and action instrument and measurement instrument in one, except that it's all based on public management, on sanctioning executives, and that is something that only the government can do. Why doesn't this happen anywhere? Governments don't want to do it. You know, I was thanked in three countries for this advice. I said, great, great monitoring. We're going to keep it to ourselves. Yeah. We're not going to put it on the web. Um. My name is Tom Bridal. I was at uh, USAID working on anti-corruption programs until last year, and I'm now at a company called Comonix International, which does USAID contracts. I'm a big fan of your model in general. I actually just tried to bring exactly that public procurement analysis to Georgia, and because they're exactly in the situation of state capture, that you know is I think common for kind of these semi-reformist governments that you see. I, I wanted to ask you, though, about something that you just mentioned very briefly, which is assessment in sectors more than the broader government uh, dynamic, which is to say, like, you know, we're concerned very much now around, like, not just procurement, but corruption throughout the supply chains and things like, you know, health, for example, is the classic example, but also, you know, education and humanitarian assistance in um, uh, um, you know, land is another classic example, but but all the, the water procurement issue, the, the infrastructure issues and things like that. If you thought and have begun to develop measures around corruption in those areas, and I don't know if others have, have some thoughts about that as well, but I'd be interested to hear what your, your thoughts are about sectoral corruption indices. Thank you very much. My name is Luzewies van Milan. I'm the Executive Director of Transparency International Netherlands. Lovely to see a colleague here. Thank you for your presentation. Um, I, um, I wanted to uh, ask a question kind of broadly about what your advice would be because this session is about using these indices as an actual tool for change. 
Uh, speaking from my experience working in the Netherlands, and I loved all your figures because, um, of course, working here deeply on you know the the way that corruption works in the Netherlands uh, situation, of course, even worse than 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 we see here. Um, I don't know if others know this, but uh, we actually opted out of the influence peddling part of the UN Convention Against Corruption because we think influence peddling is just part of the way we do business in Holland. Um, and we do a lot of this illicit financial flows facilitating and, uh, you know, what, uh, especially what Mo Ibrahim was talking about this morning, uh, you know, money being channeled out of Africa. Um, it's done, sadly, through our accountants and lawyers and everything else. So we have our, our work cut out for us. And I think the challenge that I run into um, is that uh, a lot of this work is divvied up between eight different government departments who don't speak to each other. There's different organizations who are, you know, the prosecutor's office, you have the tax inspectorate, etc. cetera. Um, and uh, a lot of miscommunication, everybody's in their own fields. The Ministry of Foreign Affairs is now running after this initiative of the anti-corruption court, rather than working on prevention and, and these kind of issues. So, so you, it's, I find it quite difficult um, as an activist, and that's why I'd love to have all of the panel's uh, advice, on, on how to actually effectuate that change. Because you say all you need is a couple of good journalists. We have them. But then you have a bunch of politicians who kind of run after whatever m news thing there was, and then you lose track of them. And then with the small NGOs working with partners, working with stakeholders, where we really managed to make a huge difference, getting new legislation, it's a huge impact, but not nearly as much, I think, as, as we would like. So do you have any silver bullets that some of us local activists could, uh, could take along for, with advice? Thank you. I was just going to say, um, I'll give Alina a chance to respond to the first question um, uh, in a second, but I first want to see if um, any of the other panelists here have a response um, in particular to this last question about um, the various um, agencies and arms within government. Any takers? about the question how to drive a chance. Listen, I, want to, I don't want to discourage you, but I wanted to challenge you. I agree with the we and Young that there is no uh, perfect uh, indicator to measure uh, things on the ground. So uh, institutions and the individual which are trying to measure corruption or rule of law and so on, they are really a champion because they are trying to approach something which is uh, almost impossible. Uh, from my experience of 38 years in public servant, among which uh, 20 years in high-level position, I would say that uh, uh, I, have, I heard uh, many uh, governments saying that uh, we need to understand how these uh, indicators are structured, uh, how are they built to try to improve our ranking. And I tell them, stop cheating, please. Stop cheating. It's not, it's not because you will provide information that they base it on their uh, aggregation, their data, that you will change. You can change things on the ground. It's easy from Hammurabi thousands of years ago that we, knew, we know how to combat corruption. And you can stick to one sentence to combat corruption is to limit abuse of power. You, can, you, you know where the abuse of power in your country and you can uh, limit this abuse of power and you will you will, uh, you will diminish corruption, then you will improve your ranking. So if you want to, to work with uh, indicators to improve you, you, your ranking, you can do it, and we have a ranking that doesn't reflect the reality. I can tell you about the ranking of the United Nations, uh, 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 which have the, uh, such a scorecard card from the uh, NCAC, United Nations Convention Against Corruption from 2003, and they measure the peer review to measure the level to what they extent uh, uh, countries they are complying with uh, the rules of the uh, anti-corruption convention and uh, this anti-corruption convention tell you just you need to, to take this law about whistleblowing about uh, access to information you can do all this law but you can't change and i myself i i presented the laws uh, to, uh, with in the parliament but on the ground nothing changed because you can have, so be careful about, uh, about uh, relying on uh, these indicators. You, that's why I'm pleading for having uh, local measurement indicators, because local measurement indicators can, 
can uh, complement uh, international and global indices because uh, they are made customized by people who are working, who knows the reality. So they can provide insight, they can provide you the real picture. So the real picture is not provided by international, uh, by, by, by international. They can approach the reality, but it's not the reality. And, do, and, the, and the, 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 that's why government, uh, it has one advantage that, uh, for instance, for with the, uh, uh, the, the perception index of transparency international, one of its advantages that they put pressure, and the government needed to take uh, to take this issue uh, seriously. But uh, uh, my advice to uh, institutions which develop uh, uh, international indices, try to use your indices as a tool to uh, to to entertain a dialogue with government. This is, could be useful to help them to drive a change uh, locally. Thank you. Uh, thank you very much, uh, actually, to, to, to Kemal for this. So this is an illustration of what I said earlier. You know, we need to have some de jure indicators, but we have research, and research shows that de jure does not translate automatically into de facto. It does not even translate always into de facto, for instance. I can show you evidence that if you are in a, at least a moderately corrupt countries, the more restrictions you adopt to party funding, the more corrupt your politics will become because they'll start carrying around suitcases with, with dark money if they cannot do it, okay? So we should, uh, there is this simple frame of mind out there that it's enough to pass a law for something. It doesn't work like this, okay? That is why, that is why we need us. So that's first thing. Very quick advice on this transparency thing. So I think it is really about, about the activism and then I come to sectors, right? It's really about the number of volunteers. What worked for me? But in better times, let's say 10, 15 years ago when there was higher trust on the internet. For me, the internet worked very well. And all this association thing, it was before the Russian trolls and all this, all this environment. Okay, what worked was simply, I would publish maps. I wanted to know the annual reports of all the uh, municipalities in Romania, right? Because the government was not even bothering to have a statistics. You know, when they first had their capacity evaluation in 10 years, because Brussels asked for it, they sent Ernst and Young to my office in Berlin, and they tell, told me, we heard that you have some sort of time series on government capacity. Can we give it to us so that we associate the government? They never kept an evidence of who published and who did not publish annual reports. And of course, I could not collect by myself these annual reports. I dispatched a number of emails, right? I published on the website. I had a big history. And of course, a big mouth being on television. So even today, I receive annual reports. I haven't done this in 15 years, but some people still send them. But some people didn't. So then what did I take in doing since I didn't have enough people? I would publish maps. And I would say, this is a blank area. Nobody answers from this. Is there nobody living in the county of Reila who can go knock at the door of the mayor and say, why don't you send the annual reports? And it works fabulously well. We got called from people who said, you know, I didn't volunteer because I thought maybe it's someone more authorized. There's nobody to go, I'll go. It's a five minutes drive for me, okay? And you can do tasks, you can say, I need this number of people, but all you need to do is to have a social media place. In my case, it was even a website where people come to have traffic. So people share to have, you don't have many, you need to have many activists. If you have 1,000 committed people and they're geographically spread, you know, they can really do the work of an army. We have good governance armies in the same way as the bad guys have their, have their bad networks. Now to sectors. We don't have much for sectors, but sec because there are two answers to this, complementary. One is uh, the same equilibrium applies to sectors. So you should be able to have an analytical framework to identify opportunities, what produces corruption by sectors, and what are the constraints missing. Right, the constraints we do by some sort of adapted stakeholder analysis for anti-corruption that I teach. The opportunities, however, are more specific by sector. And why is that? You know, in corruption and in uh, health and education, you have a lot of government failure. That means you have to identify that government, this government failure, which produces opportunities. Because in government failure, you have to remove regulation. You don't have to add regulation. It's probably some bad regulation which creates the corruption. You know, somebody puts something out there so that 10 importers of medicine have a rent. You have to identify that and remove that, okay? But you also have market failure corruption in, um, 
in both, both in education and government. So this is really more complicated analytics. I don't think there is something big out there. I have to finish by the end of this year a book called Rethinking Corruption, where I'm going to have chapters on education and health, which are going to be like textbooks, okay? But they're not written yet because look what I'm, I'm doing instead of keeping up to, to the good work. Thank you. <laughs> Thank you. Uh, good morning, all. Uh, my name is Roberto Bando. I live in, in Washington, D.C., and I work for the Pan American Development Foundation. Um, all of you have touched upon the issue of dissemination outlets, either television or, or the news outlets in the Arab world uh, or social media. I would like to hear any reflection on, um, on polarization, media polarization, the blurring lines between political opinion, political commentary versus, you know, independent policy analysis, how also social media has... Uh, evolve, I guess you mentioned Russian trolls, but all, if, let's call it evolution, if you will, and also how you know big business uh, is you know investing heavily on news outlets uh, and kind of pushing the boundaries between what used to be you know local, very localized, uh, independent, uh, smaller, smaller outlets. Thank you. Thank you for the question on media and social media. Thank you. First of all, uh, let me compliment. The nice presentation. The fact that we have so many asking questions here, it means the, the presentation is very, very interesting. Um, from Kenya, I'm the head of uh, Ethics and Anti-Corruption Commission. My question is just more of a comment than a question. We have a uh, massive infrastructure development going on in sub-Saharan Africa. The biggest argument and uh, observation is that there are complaints that these projects are highly inflated. And surprisingly, some of these projects are government to government. Uh, any anti-corruption body like myself and uh, others do not have the technical expertise, for instance, to check whether a port facility, a railway project, a huge medical uh, project in a, in a country, that there are corrupt activities that have taken place because of that expertise. Uh, would you focus on that in future for the sub-Saharan Africa rather than just checking uh, the, the traditional uh, transparency questionnaires and look into those things because at the end of the day, those are debts that are paid from the people's taxes. Thank you. Thank you for that comment on infrastructure and it sounds like some country to country uh, um, debt and financing. Next question, please. Morning, uh, my name is Corinne Vela. I'm from the Daphne Caruana Galizia Foundation. It was set up after Daphne Caruana Galizia was killed. She was covering anti-corruption uh, activities. She was exposing corruption. And we know statistically that the most dangerous beat for a journalist is not going to a war zone, but covering political corruption at home. So when we say all we need is a couple of good journalists, actually we need a lot more than that. We need to know that journalists are safe, we need to know that the state structures actually protect journalists, and we need to know there's a high degree of press freedom. So my comment, that's my comment, my question is, what can countries do to ensure not only that we expose corruption, and not only that we rely on journalists, but that we can also protect them, and how can we make press freedom and the journalist safety a factor in fighting corruption? Thank you. Thank you for the question about journalists and uh, protection of journalists and covering corruption. So I'll turn it back to the panelists before we try to get to the um, last few questions. Um, uh, Vinicius. Okay, so uh, kind of feels like a city council here today. Um, so I, I'd like to make three quick comments. The first one, just going back very quickly to uh, my colleague from TI Netherlands. Uh, what I, I understand that, of course, Brazil and Netherlands have very different uh, state structures, but what happened, uh, what, what actually worked for us uh, working with uh, subnational governments was to define uh, specific and very objective uh, partners in each government structure. So what we were able to do was to find a focal point and just have them as our main interlocutor during uh, the, the assessments that we were conducting. That's much easier when you're talking about a subnational government, of course, but normally the, the Comptroller General's offices are our main um, focal points. Uh, 
every time we had to work with the federal government in Brazil, um, it was harder, much harder, because of the ministry structure, of course. It, it is much, much larger, and it has much more uh, responsibilities, much more uh, staff, too. <laughs> So uh, we always try to take the same approach, but it, it, it just doesn't work the same way. So I, I'm not <laughs> giving you a possible uh, uh, solution, but just sharing some of our experience uh, working on the subnational level. Uh, regarding uh, media, social media, and I'm also uh, taking the opportunity to talk about uh, journalists and, and their protection. Um, Brazil, of course, has seen an authoritarian rise in the past few years. And we've gone through, we are going through uh, setbacks in the anti-corruption sector, democracy, um, elections, uh, human rights. So it is not, definitely not the best time. It is actually the worst time uh, in Brazilian uh, democratic history to be talking about this. Um, but what we've been trying to do in our projects is to, uh, to some level, partner also with civil society and with journalists, especially local journalists, and have um, a, a sort of a, a, a community, a local community and a national community of people sharing experiences and uh, uh, trying to conduct the assessments and trying to, to also advance uh, change. Um, of course, we, we haven't had any cases of um, um, you know, uh, anyone being uh, attacked or, or something like that, directly attacked. Uh, but this is always uh, a possibility, of course. And I would say we desperately need a national uh, program to protect journalists, to protect activists in an effective manner. It's not only the case of Brazil, I'm sure. It is the case of many countries that are represented here today, and that is an urgent uh, measure that we need. Thank you, Vinicius. Um, I know Kamal's going to want to respond to the infrastructure question, but Wei Nung, maybe first, I want to see if you, there's uh, um, a couple questions you want to respond to. Uh, thanks, just very, very quickly. I think the, just to our colleague from TI, I think just to let you know what's worked for us, which may not work for, for you, I think the, a couple of just rules of thumb. I think the first is, uh, of course, like um, Venetia just mentioned, find champions, find champions in government who are more predisposed. Um, secondly, um, so offer solutions, uh, try to solve problems. Uh, thirdly, uh, work with technocrats, not just politicians. And, and fourthly, uh, let them take due credit because a lot of the work still needs to be done by the civil servants in government. We found that that works in the countries that we work in. I'm happy to have a longer conversation. Secondly, um, the point about the procurement, I think it's extremely important and that shows us just how important government capabilities are. Uh, in Singapore Ministry of Finance, for instance, in the Auditor General's office, there's a large uh, presence of procurement experts uh, people who understand industry market and cost benchmarks and are able to evaluate whether or not a tender is value for money or whether the price of a tender has been inflated. So I think that's one of the capabilities that shows us just how important it is to build those capabilities within government. Uh, let me answer the question of uh, our friend from uh, Kenya. Listen, your role as a chairman of the anti-corruption agency is uh, crucial and your role is very important to, to drive uh, uh, your uh, country's effort in uh, combating corruption. But uh, you are not the one, because you don't have the expertise, and I don't think that you have uh, the necessary resources to combat corruption in uh, a large-scale uh, project like this. But your role is to provide the framework. Your role could be also to audit the system, not the responsibility to prevent corruption is not your responsibility. It's the responsibility of the institution which is in charge of the project. Today, what you can do is like uh, the uh, famous uh, UK Anti-Bribery Act, which uh, provided an innovative uh, uh, crime which criminalized the uh, failure to, prov to prevent corruption. So your role is uh, to make sure that they have the system to prevent corruption within a project. There are a lot of uh, systems, there are a lot of tools. I know some of the tools in which I... Uh, taught to uh, the engineers, uh, because we started with these uh, tools, uh, PAX uh, program to uh, design it to prevent uh, corruption in infrastructure, big infrastructure project. And these uh, 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 tools uh, could be uh, standardized, standardized and could be also validated by uh, an external party. So your role is uh, to make sure that uh, every, every project or every single institution has its own system of prevention. And then your role would be 
would become uh, easy because you will you will audit not the you will not look for the corruption cases you will look whether the system prevent enough the uh, occurrence of corruption or not I, we don't have too much time left, uh, 10 minutes, so I will let the last three um, uh, individuals here present your questions and we'll try to get through as quickly as possible. Oh yes, of course, and um, Mr. Bill Newcomb will uh, have a closing statement at the end. Okay, perfect. <laughs> Hi, my name is Siri Nelson. I'm the Executive Director of National Whistleblower Center, which is based in Washington, D.C and we'll be having a session in this room at 3.30 about the Whistleblower Bill of Rights. Um, Kamal, you're the only one who I heard mention whistleblowing, so thank you for doing that. I wanted to ask the rest of you um, how you plan on incorporating whistleblower protections, both de jure and de facto, in your indices because whistleblowing activities are critical to fighting corruption. Hello, I'm Swet Fern Lee from uh, the board of the World Justice Project. I have three questions, for, uh, and thank you all for, for just an amazing presentation. I have three questions, and I'll try and be uh, brief. Um, how do your indices deal with situations of legalized corruption, where the government embeds the ability to be corrupt, uh, where you know, it is, it's, it's not illegal, but a senior government minister appoints his wife to the position of a very senior position in the country, and she is paid in secret, but all legal, signed off by the board, millions of dollars year on year, or where the government, um, and we touched on whistleblowers, uh, embeds laws that um, silence whistleblowers, basically allowing them to be threatened with laws that say it's a false statement of fact, or where the auditor general is the wife of a senior minister in government. What does one do? How do the indices deal with legalized corruption? Secondly, um, we talked, and Wayning had a very interesting presentation, as did Alina, on perception and reality and how much one takes hard facts as opposed to perception, and some how, do, how do indices deal with this? That sometimes there is a huge gap between perception and reality, and sometimes there's a time lag between perception and reality, which leads me to my third question. How do indices deal with a point that Alina dealt with um, towards the end of her presentation? on the ability of rich governments, China, and China's not the only one, to buy influence on your indices. Thank you. Hi, I'm uh, Mark Worth from Delft. Uh, just regarding Kenya, I noticed that uh, in January, the, there was a bill that would give rewards to whistleblowers who expose tax evasion I promise you, if you have a reward program for procurement and public projects, people would come forward and uh, report these things. The uh, panel is called Corruption Measurement as an Agent of Change, and I'm sure that you have hundreds of examples where a measurement led to an improvement in real life, so it'd be nice to hear a few of those examples. Thank you. Wonderful, that's a great final question. So what I'll do is maybe start with Alina and then give um, each uh, panelist a chance to respond to whichever questions they're able to and uh, uh, please try to keep your responses to two minutes at a maximum so we can all get to lunch soon. Okay, thank you very much. So first, simply put, there are currently two big understandings of corruption out there that we operate with uh, and we should just be aware of this. One is what I would call the thin understanding of corruption. Corruption simply as abuse of bureaucratic office. And this is the situation to which I think a concurrent panel, the OECD panel addresses in the same time as ours, because they developed some organization-based integrity tools. Now, where do those apply and where does this thin definition applies? Applies to the very limited number of country where you have already succeeded in the historical process of having a bureaucracy 
a central apparatus which is autonomous from private interest. Now, how many countries like this we have in the world? It's a matter for debate. But if you look at uh, the la latest VDEM evaluation, there are probably like 31. You know, more pessimistic authors say like 24. So these are a selected number of countries where you can deal with this thin measurement of corruption. For all the others, the, thin, the thick approach to corruption applies, where we consider, I consider corrupt in all my indicators, and I know people do in all the global corruption barometer in 110 countries, people think the same. People actually think that a large, significant part of corruption is legal. They think legal arrangements are made to favor certain groups, and they are. Okay, and this is why I said all the time that we, you have to deal with government failure, that you have to eliminate regulation. Let's not conceive anti-corruption as just adding regulation, in particularly since we are so poor in implementing it, right? And so this thick approach of corruption is the one which matters for development. And we try to do things for, th for it. I did not mention it earlier, but there is a request from G20 to come up with better measurements, as you say, for better measurements, actionable measurements, not the Euro measurement, for countries in order to complement the UNCAC review, so not to be just based on this, on this very you know, rudimentary indicators it has now. And we have an expert group at UNODC where I work together with a few of my former students. So we are trying to put together these documents and we're gonna look around in a few months for countries to pilot these instruments. I'm gonna ask you, I mean, you, what if I try, give you an example, can I throw you one of my pilot indicators to you? I want to know in each and given country, how many times was the government sued last year by either citizens or any sort of legal entity? And how many times did the government lose? And I propose to use this measure to replace the current measures that we have of judicial independence, which are calculated by World Independent Forum or someone else, World Economic Forum, sorry, and where Saudi Arabia is doing as well as US and UK, if you check it, for instance. Or Egypt closed the constitutional court, but they didn't really, it doesn't really show in the index much. But you know very well that a statistic like the one I mentioned now is maybe not even computed in some countries. So it's really gonna be a challenge. You know, I'm looking forward to governments and civil society partners who are going to do this, this effort, okay? And on this, uh, on this story of, uh, of journalists and, and everything, I mean, anti-corruption when it is like restoring, like restoring, like building for the first time, a fundamental equilibrium in the thick sense, where we try to enforce the principle of ethical universalism, where everybody is treated fairly and equally. This is a major endeavor, right? It's a major endeavor where we have allies, but it's also a lot of collective action problems. It's not gonna be done in, in one day. So this is a struggle. Do not expect that governments, if governments are part of the problem, governments are not always going to be a solution. A government infiltrated by organized crime is not gonna protect me as a journalist. That is the situation in Malta, right? And ending with Mark Worth's question, what did I do in my years as an activist in a country where the parliament was corrupt, which is in most young democracies? If you look in global corruption barometers, parliaments and parties are on top of corrupt institutions, right? So what do you do about that, okay? We do not want a dictator to come, right? So we want to clean the parliament. So I created a coalition for a clean parliament which was based on a measurement. I define corruption jointly with political parties, I define corruption jointly with the public because it was the public who was the great force behind because the public voted. So I made a survey, I knew how the public defined corruption, I went to each political party and I said, look, the public considers not, not only theft is corrupt, but they also consider that if some politicians move repeatedly from one party to another, it's also corrupt because I voted you to be a liberal, I didn't vote you to be a socialist, you should not be able to do that. There was a year in my country where 75% of mayors have switched party because the central government was only paying discretionarily its own mayors, okay? And that, what was the point of having local elections then? Because in the two things, they all moved all around, right? So uh, Just we a wanted quick time to check. We are at noon, so I do want to give everyone so a chance. We wanted to introduce political migration in the definition of political corruption. So we had like a longer definition. Everybody agreed with it. 
when we agreed on it, we started monitorization, and then we produced a measurement. Out of 200 candidates for parliament, 190 did not correspond to the criteria. Everyone was in this coalition. We publicized this. A lot of media, all free media, which was not a lot, but a part of free media, participated. So I can tell you exactly how many corrupt candidates were, how many made it to parliament, how many lost by voters, and how many were pulled out by political parties. So it's very simple and actionable measurement. Everybody can do it if you're not afraid to go to jail, because this is a distinct, <laughs> this is a distinct possibility. But you know, we do it for our own countries. I wouldn't do this for other people's countries. Thank you, Alina. So, <laughs> 30 seconds each, so we don't keep you uh, from lunch if that's okay, or as quickly as possible, please. Okay. Yeah. So I'll be quick. Um, so I wanted to talk about uh, whistleblowing and legalized corruption, but maybe we can have a quick chat after that. But we're trying to bring that into our indicator right now. So we're gonna have interesting results soon. Uh, just to talk about change a little bit, uh, we don't believe that indicators should exist by themselves. They don't, they, they don't have any, any value if they exist by themselves. They should lead to, to some level of change. So what we've been trying to do is to build those partnerships to bring change, to promote change to some level. And we are not, uh, we always tell that to local governments, we don't want to be the rigorous teacher who just likes to give bad grades. We want them to get better grades <laughs> so that we can keep developing and keep uh, also challenging them in upcoming indices. So thank you so much for this opportunity and I'm, I'm, I'm available to talk later. Just a quick answer to your question about the uh, gap between uh, perception and reality. I cannot tell you uh, the gap because the gap depends on the country. But uh, as far as my country is regarded, I uh, conducted uh, some resources last year. And I found out that uh, uh, reality and the perception is, uh, with regard to corruption, is two completely words. For a number of reasons. And this is one of the weaknesses of uh, the uh, perception-based based indicators. Because there are a lot of uh, uh, perception bias. One of them is the social desirability. Uh, in our country, we talk a lot about uh, corruption. And corruption is uh, being the favorite subject of uh, political uh, parties. So uh, the, 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 the information that, uh, uh, that is directed to the public opinion is completely false. So if you ask op uh, public opinion about the corruption, they will tell you what they have learned from uh, politicians, from social media, and so on. So uh, be, uh, be aware of the uh, so, so, so desirability, social desirability and the perception bias when you conduct your, uh, your, uh, your perception-based uh, indicator. It depends on the country. Thanks, and just a few very quick responses to the point on about of influence on indices. So I think the first thing is it's very important for all of us who produce indices to be uh, cognizant and aware of the potential for influence and to respond to that quite forcefully. So the first is, I think Alina mentioned a little bit of that, the, the need for independent funding and the need to um, be independent of uh, pol potential influence actors. The second is, of course, to ensure that particularly when we are doing the index, uh, although some of us are formerly from the government of Singapore, we have zero involvement of the government in developing the index, no input whatsoever, uh, no funding whatsoever. So I think that's important to preserve independence. I think the third thing is in terms of the uh, transparency over data and methodology. I think indices that produce all the data, they publish all the data online, the data sources, uh, the methodology is clear and transparent, and therefore it's obvious if it's being gamed in any way. And I think that's important responsibility that we have as creators of indices and knowledge products. Uh, the second is that, uh, just to, to, to follow up on Trevor's point, you know, I think it's a very important point that the definition of corruption is not universal, and that therefore uh, some kinds of government behavior might be strictly legal, but might be perceived as problematic in some way. So I think in that sense, actually, we look at citizen perceptions, and we do uh, fully acknowledge Carmel's point about the subjectivity in uh, citizen perceptions, and there's uh, definitely a bias. But I think one useful thing that the citizen perceptions have that perhaps we use broadly is in terms of uh, passing the laugh test. So for instance, uh, there might be a, a the URA form of uh, you know the institutions are in place, laws are in place, but does the public feel that it's having an impact? Does the public still feel that there is uh, some form of injustice or some form of uh, problematic uh, arrangements that are going on? Um, I think ultimately this goes back to the humility that we have in interpreting indices and indicators. There's no perfect index. We're trying to measure very complex things like anti-corruption and good governance. So, uh, I mean, one of the useful things that I found is the ability of these indices to spark conversations and spark debate. So I hope that that's what's been going on here, and I thank you all for your time.
And la oh, please go ahead. <laughs> And lastly, I want to turn it over to Mr. Newcomb, founder yeah, of you. WJP. Thank you, Leslie, and thank you to the audience. This is a wonderfully full room, great questions, lots of attention, and to a superb panel, just a few points. I think that the WJP index has been sort of relegated to the sidelines in some ways, and let me just say that I hear perception mentioned about 150 times in the last hour, and that's part of the data. You want to collect perceptions. But there is a gap between that and reality, and one way to bridge that gap is to go household to household and ask that family, have you had to pay a bribe to, to a government official to get a business license? Let's get that data. Have you had to pay a bribe to get your daughter into a medical clinic? Let's get that data. Perception's wonderful, but this sounds a whole lot like a bunch of indexes built on perception. We undertake the expense and the hassle of retaining professional survey teams who survey 1,000 randomly selected households in every one of the countries that we measure. And that's the way we get some data which we triangulate with perception data, which we think gives us a more honest, more real view of what's going on. So I'd love to have this, uh, a, another panel talk about the extent to which those reality checks come in the form of talking with real folks on the ground. That's where corruption matters, and some of it's in very small versions, some in very large versions. The, the experts can tell you about corruption at the government level. They cannot tell you what goes on in the neighborhoods on the ground, I don't think. Someone's shaking his head over here. We can talk later about that. And se second thing is, the second point is that uh, be careful, you, those of you who publish indexes, been alluded to, I think, but to be blunt about it, be careful about which countries or which states come to you to learn more about your findings about them because some are there to game the system. They want to get a better score and they will play games to get a better score. There, that's a danger. Some of them will come to you in good faith and they'll want to learn from you why they're not scoring better so they can do a better job. And it's not our job to advise them in that regard. We are just holding up the mirror to the reality in their jurisdictions. And finally, just to reinforce the value of going local, we have just completed a subnational index for Mexico, 31 states, and guess what we've learned? We've learned that three things follow from that at least. Number one is the closest, the closer the folk are to the data, the more the data matters to them. It's one thing to say there's corruption in this nation of a certain sort, and you say to yourself, well, I'm in a big populous nation, why do I care much about that? It's quite another thing to say, in my home state, we have corruption in these forms that you can react to. So going subnational, going even impressive to me that transparency has gone to municipalities, that's remarkable. But just to go state, just to go subnational is so powerful. The second reason it's powerful is because the government in one state looks at this map of corruption around the country and says, yikes. Yikes, we are more corrupt than half of the other states. That's not a good thing for trade. What are we gonna, or for me getting reelected? Now that it's public, what can I do about that? So it, it creates an opportunity for, for competition, which can create opportunities for reform. And the third thing is that in federal systems, this creates a map for the federal government to determine where to allocate its scarce resources. We have lots of problems in lack of rule of law, in particular corruption. Over here, let's pay more attention to that. Or this is an area now where we need some federal policy to bring uniformity to the problem. So all three of those consequences follow from going subnational. We are we've just been engaged by the EU to do a sub excuse me, a subnational indexing of the EU. Stay tuned within about two years, you'll be able to see what's going on within countries, within all the EU countries, and I think that data is gonna be very powerful towards reform as well. So again, thank you for being here. This is splendid stuff, but it's, um, it, it's not enough just to go to the decision makers. You gotta go to the folks who are affected by it. And what we try to do very hard in our index is to reveal the reality of the root lack of rule of law in the daily lives of the folk, of people who are citizens and are not in positions of power, they're in positions to be taken advantage of, and that's what we're trying to root out. Thank you.